the best health care is there in ways big and small. There when we most and least expect it. We may not see it, but we feel it. It lets us know we're not in this alone. Everyone deserves a health care partner who never quits. One who's there for what matters. United Healthcare, there for what matters. It's Not Your Fault is a podcast for parents, caregivers, and young people navigating the world and its challenges. Here's your host, Brandon Jones. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another installment of It Is Not Your Fault, a teen mental health podcast. I am your host, Brandon Jones. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about something that you probably have not considered when it comes to the mental health of your young person. I, being the nerd that I am, was doing some searching, um, just doing some research on young people and figuring out what are the current trends, the current happenings with young people's mental health. As I gear up for my organization's um, upcoming conference here, and I just wanted to be, you know, updated and abreast with the current issues that are going on with young people. And I ran across a research study that came out uh, recently, came out in February of 2024. And this research study is entitled Making Cities Mental Health Friendly for Adolescents and Young Adults. Now, the title of this raises a little bit of eyebrows, but What's really in the article is what really got me to go, hmm, what in the world is going on? And what the article kind of, or not the article, the research study kind of suggests is that children who grow up in urban environments actually have poorer mental health outcomes than children who don't. Now, most of my work has been in the inner cities of the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. I've done work in Suburban Ramsey School District, which is a suburb of St. Paul. I've done work in um, Southwest Minneapolis, which is somewhat of a suburb uh, in the Dinah area. I've done work even in the Robbinsdale Maple Grove area of Minneapolis as well. So areas that are within the metropolitan um, dynamic. I mean, I've worked all across the United States with different schools and organizations in different environments, urban and rural, but most of my work directly with young people has been urban youth. So this article to me, um, or I keep saying article, it's a research study. This research study to me is interesting. It's interesting because it validated a lot of things that I've seen over my career, but now they have some research behind it. And this isn't, to, again, I'm not using code words here. I want to be very clear. I know in a lot of spaces, people say urban youth, and they're really talking about black youth. That's not necessarily what this study is talking about. They didn't even mention ethnicity or race. But that does come into play here when you think about who are these youth that they're referring to in the study. So again, it's not directly stating that black or brown youth. I know that people love that term as well. Um, so Spanish-speaking youth and African-American youth are uh, have worse mental health outcomes. That's not what this is stating. This is talking about just youth in general who grow up in urban environments, which makes me wonder, is that the best environment for children to develop? If they're saying that these environments are detrimental to the mental health and well-being of adolescents, what should we do about urban life? What should we do about that? hustle and bustle. So let me dive into some of the pieces of this research. Again, I read these things so you don't necessarily have to. Plus, most folks aren't digging in the, you know, the virtual crates to find these research articles like my nerdy self. So I'm gonna read a few things from the article that I found to be interesting. So the article, I keep saying article, it's a research study, the research study, sorry. I'm, I'm so used to reading articles that I'm probably gonna slip up and say that a few times. But the research study says this, Urban life shapes the mental health of city dwellers. And although cities provide access to health, education, and economic gain, urban environments are often detrimental to mental health. Increased urban urbanization over the next three decades will be accompanied by growing populations of children and adolescents living in cities. Shaping these aspects of urban life, 
that influence young people's mental young youth mental health could have uh, enormous impacts on adolescent well-being and adult trajectories. We in we invite a multidisciplinary global group of researchers, practitioners, advocates, and youth, young people to complete uh, sequentially ser sequential surveys to identify and prioritize the characteristics of mental health friendly cities for young people. Here we show a set of ranked, a set of ranked characteristic statements, um, characteristic statements grouped by personal, interpersonal, community, organizational, policy, and governmental domains of intervention, life skills, for personal development, valuing and accepting young people's ideas and choices, providing safe space for social connection, employment and job security, centering youth input uh, in urban planning and design, and addressing adverse social determinants were priorities by domain. We report that adversities that COVID-19 generated and linked and, and link relevant actions to these data. Our findings highlighted the need for uh, intersectional, inter, yeah, intersexual, that's an interesting word, intersexual multi-level intervention, and for inclusion, equitable, equitable, and participatory design of cities that support youth mental health. All right, that was a mouthful. In essence, what they they're giving an overview of their study. They had a multidisciplinary team that involved policymakers, folks from organizations who work with youth, young people themselves, and other folks in the community to come together and create this. Um, uh, it's called it's a social economic a social a socio ecological model. It's a big word, which is just a diagram that talks about these different areas and what things need to be done in order to improve the outcomes of young people who live in cities. So that's that's ultimately what the study did. So they spent a lot of time working on this. Um, I'm just going to read some more interesting pieces from the actual study. So they say that young people's interpersonal experience and interpersonal relationships are nested within systems of community and organizational relationships. Study participants prioritize access to safe space for youth to gather and connect among the three characteristics in the domain of the community. And ranking and rankings were identical for each framing. At the organizational domain, two characteristics shared high meaning, high meaning rank rankings, employment opportunities that allow job security and satisfaction, and a responsive and supportive educational system. Healthcare services and educational services were the organizations most frequently referenced in relation to youth mental health, whereas employment opportunities ranked first among terms of feasible of implementation, provision, and youth-friendly health services ranked first for immediacy of impact on youth, and youth mental health. With the exception of the community organizational domains, more panelists chose to frame their responses in terms of immediacy of impact on youth mental health. So what they're saying is, where do we start? Where do we start with helping young people increase their mental and emotional well-being? How do we assist young people making sure that they have all the things that they need for their mental and emotional well-being? And what they're identifying is starting off in the school systems and the healthcare providers is the best place to start. Again, this aligns pretty well with some of my own experiences. I know that right now one of the best places to get young people connected to mental health services is through their school, which is in, which is interesting because we know that most schools do not have mental health services, and and the ones that do, they don't have enough to support the youth that actually need the services in the school. Most schools, if they're well equipped with well equipped with the mental health provider or even have built in mental health services, they may have one to two, and if they're lucky three to four mental health providers, but that is very, very rare. I think that this article, or again, article, this research study is highlighting one of my big ideas when it comes to helping young people, which is we have to reinvent and reinvest um, our resources in schools to have more of a well-being component. It's going to take a lot of money and a lot of intentionality to do that, but I think we need to look at making sure that schools have mental health services built in not only for the students, but also for the folks who work there. Let's be honest. Like a lot of people are dealing with a lot, and it's not just pandemic related. I know we like to pin 
point the pandemic for a lot of these things. But if we're going to be honest, we know that this has been an issue for a while. The pandemic really has just forced us to deal with it, and it magnified a lot of the things that we've seen for quite some time. But of course, the pandemic is an easy thing to pinpoint and say, oh, it's because of the pandemic that we're dealing with these things. But for those who've been doing this work, we've known that this has been a huge issue. It just ha it's just people just kind of sucked it up and dealt with it and we didn't talk about it. But now, like I said, the pandemic's magnified it and it's like, oh, we need to do something. We need to figure this out. So it's important that we understand that, yes, the institutions are important. Um, the social, the socio ecological model that they created uh, is good. I think that this is a helpful way of thinking about this. Again, most common folks like you who are listening to this podcast, you're not going to you're not going to look up these type of research studies. You're not going to look at these models. And most people who do, you know, some of the stuff is so boring. It looks so boring that you probably won't even sniff at it. Um, but again, that's why you're here at the podcast, so I can translate some of this information to you. One of the other things I want to highlight here before I get out is they talked about the urban built environment. They talked about why are the cities so complicated? They talked about access. They talked about green space. They talked about overcrowding. We talked about cleanliness of neighborhoods, so things that are considered to be slums or very dirty. Uh, so like trash is around, people aren't recycling, you know, people are throwing things out of the window. Uh, things are breaking down like vehicles or objects and furniture, and people are leaving those things you know, in their backyards or in their front yards or just dumping them in the street. Like These are real issues that I think we don't always consider impact our mental and emotional health but if you think about if you're a 13 year old kid you want to go outside and play but you you can't you don't have enough you know green space to play because there's an old dirty couch outside and a broken television and the trash isn't picked up and you know there's just like just nastiness all around that's not very open for you to play and you don't want your kids to be playing in that type of you know, environment where things can be dangerous. You know, it reminds me actually of a story that I have. I have a I have a scar on my right leg, right below my knee, where I got cut by a television. <laughs> I was probably 13, 14 years old. I was playing basketball in the backyard. Um, the way we we had enough space to have a little basketball court. It was not a real court. It was like a dirt patch and a hoop that we had in the back. And I remember I was playing with my brothers and my cousins. We were playing basketball and I went up and got grabbed a rebound. And I remember I grabbed the rebound and I just kind of did a, a average basketball play. I wasn't like some LeBron James or anything. I just kind of turned around, dribbled the ball. And as I turned, there was this old TV that was sitting out there. And I, I don't even remember touching the TV. All I know is I turned, I started dribbling the ball and my brothers and cousins just were like, Brandon, dude, you're bleeding. And I remember looking down and there were just like in the movies, there was blood skirting out of my leg. Like it was just like gushing, like, like a pump. Now I always thought that was in the movies that did that, but apparently if you hit, I believe it's called the artery vein. It's the veins that come directly from your heart. You do have that pulsating blood squirt. And I had that coming out of my leg. So I remember I was like, oh, I didn't even feel it happen. I don't even remember really even touching the TV. It was so quick and that glass was so sharp. It just sliced open my leg and I had to get stitches. I had to go to the emergency room and get stitches. And I have a scar to this day on my leg from that. And it makes me think about this, like, you know, the, the conditions that young people just in order to play in a lot of urban environments, it, there's safety concerns. You know, there's concerns about the air that young people are breathing. There's concerns about you know, just the objects that people may find themselves stepping on or, you know, um, running into like that. This is a real thing. And I, and I, and I want to bring this to your attention. I'm glad that folks are studying this, but it's important for us to start thinking about our environment. It's not just the outside environments. This is what this is talking about, but also the home environment, which we usually spend most time discussing as the home environment. But kids deserve to have clean spaces, fresh air, water that's clean, green spaces, grass, pavement, things that are, you know, not polluted. Kids deserve that because what this study is telling us is that it does impact their mental and emotional well-being. We all have a role and a part to play in this. Uh, we can all do our part to make sure that the earth is, you know, sustainable. 
and you know maintained and kept as best as possible so you know you might not have wanted think you were going to hear this on today's podcast but it is something that we have to consider is that kids do deserve to play in spaces where they feel safe and it's not just you know violence i know i spent a lot of time i spent a lot of podcast episodes talking about both uh intimate partner or domestic violence and community-based violence because you know my heart is in a lot of that work but it's extremely important too to just make sure that the spaces are well kept our dwellings are well maintained for our kids mental and emotional well-being they deserve more and better spaces to play so with that that's going to wrap up today's podcast again this is not your fault 18 mental health podcast aimed at talking to and having conversations with parents and caregivers to make sure that you're well informed and equipped to help your young person navigate this world that we live in I'm your host, Brandon Jones. You can check us out in three main places. The first place, and I'll put this article in this place, is on Facebook. We have a Facebook group for the podcast. Just go ahead and put in It's Not Your Fault in the search engine. You can find us. We'll you'll find other clips from the podcast, other helpful tips, and things like this. Uh, not an article. This research study will be posted there. Also, you can find me on my own personal website, www.jegna.org. That's Jegna. Dot org where you can send me any request or if you need any help navigating the world, I do my best to help you out. And the third place is at ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. That's ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com where you can find myself and some other awesome, well-equipped uh, podcasters who are just doing amazing work uh, in this world. So definitely check us out at ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. And as always, be safe, be constructive, and be well. I'll see you next time. Peace. To check out previous episodes of It's Not Your Fault or to learn more about Brandon Jones, log on to ShilettaMakesMeLaugh.com. It's not just another day in your life. Things are changing for the better. At Comcast, we see those changes and we're thinking about how we use technology today to live, work, learn, and play. And we're building for the future now so we're better prepared for the wants and needs of tomorrow. That's why Comcast is rolling out multi-gig internet speeds to more than 50 million homes and businesses before the end of 2025, making our already industry-leading network even faster, smarter, greener, and more reliable. Over the decades, Comcast has been your partner, working hard to serve your community and we'll continue to be your partner. We're expanding our gigabits so you can enjoy the tiny bits that matter most. You know Shaletta makes you laugh, but did you know Shaletta Brundage can also make you think and boost your business? Media personality, activist, and comedian Shaletta Brundage founded Shaletta Makes Me Laugh to celebrate and share the best of black culture. It's a podcasting platform you can download 10 weekly podcasts hosted by African-American subject experts at ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com is also a production house creating broadcast quality commercial content. And Shaletta and her team of storytellers create powerful promotional campaigns to get businesses the brand awareness they're looking for. Some of Minnesota's top businesses trust Shaletta, and you can too. Get out the word about your events and products and get in front of communities of color with ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. She's got the power to help your business. If you're pregnant or recently delivered a baby, you're at greater risk for getting very sick from COVID-19 compared to the general population. Getting COVID-19 during pregnancy also puts you at an increased risk of having a preterm birth. That's why it's so important to protect yourself from getting COVID-19 at this time. The most important step is getting your updated COVID-19 vaccine. The vaccine is also strongly recommended if you're breastfeeding or considering pregnancy in the future. While you're pregnant, transmission of coronavirus to your child is unlikely, but a newborn could get COVID-19 after birth. Babies can get their own COVID-19 vaccine once they're six months of age. It's natural to have questions about COVID-19 during this important time. So talk to your trusted prenatal health care provider and then your baby's pediatrician. They'll be able to give you advice on the best steps to take to keep everyone in the family safe and healthy. Are you a woman known as a good listener? Do you have skills in de-escalating situations? Are you what they call a people person? 
then the Minneapolis Police Department would like to meet you. Now in a rebuilding phase, the Minneapolis Police Department is recruiting more women to wear the badge. The department offers career options for women with a high school diploma or GED. There are also opportunities for women with two and four year degrees who are ready to apply their skills in new ways. Police work makes a great second career for social workers, teachers, nurses. Women in their 30s and 40s are welcome to apply. There's no age cap. You'll be paid while you train and mentored by veteran women officers invested in your success. Minneapolis also welcomes current police officers to join the state's largest department. Make a difference on the streets, working in your community, in a career with competitive salaries and generous benefits. Go to MinneapolisMN.gov and search police jobs to find out more. People say we're made up. Tall tales. Myths. Think what you want about us, but we can all be certain of this. Recycling is real and it works. But what happens to your recycling once it leaves your home? Recycled glass is sorted in St. Paul. Then the clear glass is made into bottles for drinks, pickles, salad dressing, and more in Shakopee. At other facilities, plastic bottles get made into new plastic bottles. Recycling exists. Learn the real story behind recycling. If you live in an older home, it may contain lead-based paint on walls, woodwork, and windows. Even more bad news, lead exposure can be dangerous to young children and impact their brain development. And now, the good news. Hennepin County will fix lead hazards in your home at no cost to you. We were worried because of the paint in the windows in the bedroom. They were peeling and chipping, and we know that when paint peels and chips, and it looks a certain way that's possibly lead. We were worried for our children more so than anything. Eligible homes can qualify for up to $15,000 in upgrades. You may even qualify for new energy efficient windows. Don't worry, Hennepin County has a trusted list of pre-approved contractors. You won't even have to find companies with correct licenses or certifications. I've just done a test and it, it's positive. So we know that this is lead-based paint and then we know it's a hazard because it's creating dust every time this window moves and opens. And if you look in here, that's just full of lead paint chips. You won't have to stay with your cousin while you're getting the lead out. Hennepin County even pays for you and your family to stay in a hotel while the work is underway. The last good news is how easy it is to apply. Just go to hennepin.us backslash lead control to get started. I'm really happy with the program. We can go to bed knowing that our children are safe. That's hennepin.us backslash lead control. Tell your friends about it. Are you getting older and feeling concerned about staying safely in your own home? Or maybe it's your folks you're worried about. I get it. It's not easy getting older, especially when the house is starting to show its age too. There is help available. Individuals want to maintain and stay in their own homes for as long as they can. In Rebuilding Together Minnesota, we provide the opportunity, we provide the programs for them to do that. Rebuilding Together Minnesota has been helping eligible older Minnesotans and those with disabilities stay safe and healthy for more than 20 years. Our central AC unit was non-functional. We had plugged a portable unit in to the living room. What ended up ha happening was our electrical outlet melted and it was getting to be 90 degrees in here. Meyer was told about rebuilding Together Minnesota by his daughter. She said, well, Daddy, you need to sign up. I said, do I qualify? She said, well, you're a disabled veteran, you qualify. So we provided a new air conditioning unit for the homeowner and also new electrical service all through this veterans program that we have. Thanks to Tom and Rebuilding Together Minnesota, we are able to uh, maybe go out and get a hamburger every now and then. To find out if you qualify, go to rtmn.org. That's RTMN for Rebuilding Together Minnesota. Or if it's easier, call 651-776-4273 and tell your friends, trust me, this is news they can use.